Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right, Mark 14. That's where we are. Mark 14, Jesus and his disciples, they're eating the Passover meal. It's Thursday night, which is the beginning of Friday. You know how the, the Jews counted the days beginning at sundown. So Thursday night, it's the beginning of Friday, which is the day of Passover proper. That's Nisan 14, I mean Nisan 15, which that year was on a Friday. And he informs them that one of them will betray him. And then in 14, 22 to 26, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. And as I noted last week, we're not certain of, of all the details of how the, uh, the Passover meal was celebrated in Israel prior to A.D. 70. But whatever those details are, the Passover meal, it, it symbolized and celebrated God's deliverance of his people from Egyptian oppression and slavery. And Jesus instituted a new symbolic meal by transcending the original meaning of that ancient Passover meal. He transformed that ancient ancient meal in light of his rescuing work. So this is what he's doing. The bread represents his body and the fruit of the vine represents his blood of the covenant that's poured out for many. And as Paul says plainly in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7, Jesus is the Passover lamb. He's the innocent one who was sacrificed that God's people might be spared from death and be taken from the bondage of the devil to the glory of the kingdom of God. So you have this symbolic meal that represents God's release of them from the oppression of Egyptian bondage. Christ transforms that meal by his work. And he's, it, what he's doing is they're spared from death and taken from the bondage of the devil to the glory of the kingdom of God. Now the reference in verse 23 to Jesus having given thanks in association with the cup and the reference in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four to his having given thanks in association with the bread, that's why this ritual Christian meal is sometimes called the Eucharist. We don't generally use that term. But it comes from that giving of thanks to the Greek word to give thanks is Eucharisteo. So that's where this comes from. And there are other terms used to describe this ritual Christian meal that are derived from the Bible. That includes the breaking of bread, the table of the Lord, communion, and the Lord's Supper, which we tend to favor the Lord's Supper. So you have all of those references rooted in Scripture that are used to refer to this particular meal. Now when Jesus said in verses 22 to 24, in reference to the bread and wine, this is my body, and this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, he clearly was speaking metaphorically rather than literally. I mean, it seems clear to me. But you know that in the history of Christianity, there are groups that insist that he's speaking, at least in some sense, literally. That the, that the fruit of the vine, when it's consecrated by a priest, becomes literally his blood. And the bread becomes literally his body. But as I say, it seems clear to me that he's speaking metaphorically. The description of the wine as his blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many... Matthew adds, for the forgiveness of sins. But that description, it's universally understood to be a reference to the blood of Christ that is shed on the cross. You can see that, for example, in Hebrews chapter 9, 11 to 28. And since the crucifixion hadn't happened yet, the blood of the covenant didn't exist. So it didn't exist, so it couldn't literally be present in the cup to which Jesus referred, and that's confirmed by the fact that in Matthew chapter 26, verse 29, he speaks of the wine as fruit of the vine after its consecration. So, you know, the idea that somehow in saying, invoking something over this transforms it literally, he speaks of it still as the fruit of the vine after its consecration, 
1 Corinthians 11, 26 to 28 refers to the elements as the bread and the cup after their consecration. And elsewhere, you know that Jesus spoke of himself as a vine, a door, a shepherd. And nobody expects in those situations or contends that those metaphors have to be taken literally. So I just think this is a mistaken idea, but it's got deep roots. And there, like I said, there are different groups that hold to it. In addition to this, I think if the wine of the Lord's Supper, if this was actually changed in some literal sense into blood, then undoubtedly, it seems, there would have been some controversy or discussion about the propriety of drinking it. Robert Stein, in his commentary, says, we must remember, or, yeah, is this commentary, yeah, says, we must remember the context of the Last Supper. It involved Jews who were well acquainted with the Old Testament prohibition against drinking blood. For example, Leviticus 3.17 and other texts he cites. If the disciples literally believed that they were being told to drink blood, one would have expected them to protest strongly. One need only recall Peter's protest in Acts 10.9-16 when he was commanded to eat non-kosher meat to see how difficult it would have been for the disciples to drink real blood. Yet they exhibited no qualms in drinking the cup Jesus gave them. The early church also encountered no problems from its Jewish members in this respect. So, I mean, that makes sense to me. You would think that if they understood in any sense that he was saying this is real blood, there would have been some issue. Somebody said, well, wait a minute, you know, I, I can't do that. I've been raised all my life. I've never done anything like that. You don't get any of that. So I think it's, I just think that's a mistake and a, and a misunderstanding. Now, given that Jesus' intact body, his intact body was in the presence of the disciples when he instituted the Lord's Supper, they would never have thought, it seems to me. They would never have thought that the bread and wine were his literal body and blood. I mean, he's there right in front of them. So, you know, they would, that wouldn't have occurred to them. And Jesus was hosting a symbolic meal known as the Passover. That's the context for the remarks. His remarks would have been understood in that context. So it just seems to me that, that he's speaking metaphorically. That seems... Uh, quite clear. Now, without going into detail, in John chapter 6, verses 53 to 57, that's not the institution of the Lord's Supper. Jesus didn't institute that rite until shortly before his crucifixion. His comments there in John chapter 6 about the need to eat his flesh and drink his blood, they're a metaphorical reference to the need to appropriate, through faith, his life-sustaining as our food and drink. It's about the need to appropriate, through faith, his life-sustaining sacrifice, the giving of his body and blood. In other words, one must, by faith, partake of the benefits of his sacrifice in order to live. That's what I think he's saying in John 6. Now, because Jesus gave thanks over and he passed to the disciples a single cup, some in churches of Christ and in other groups uh, have concluded that drinking from a single cup is a requirement of the Lord's Supper. Not, not an optional practice, but that it is a requirement of the Lord's Supper. Now, while I respect all who live in accordance with what they understand to be the Lord's will, I don't think that's a correct understanding. Now, the command in Matthew 26, 27, that they drink from it. He commands them to drink from it. That doesn't specify how they're to do so. You see, it just says drink from. In other words, it doesn't demand that they each drink directly from the cup, but that they share the wine, that they share the contents of the cup. If, for example, if a host passed a bowl of salad to his guests and he said, eat from it, all of you, one can't assume 
without additional information that he was insisting they eat directly from the bowl rather than that they put some of the salad into their own bowls. You can't conclude that simply from my saying eat from it because it doesn't specify the manner in which I am to do that. You see, if I pull out of the bowl and put it, I'm still eating from it. Just as in John chapter 4, verse 12, where those who drink from a well, stuff that has been separately distributed to each of them, they are still said to what? To drink from the well. So I just don't think it specifies that. And then to make that and to read that into it and then to make that something that's absolute, I think is a mistake. And likewise, when you see the report in Mark 14, 23, they all drank from it. Well, it doesn't specify how they did so, whether they did it directly from the cup or whether they divided the contents into their own containers. And there's no reason to insist that they didn't divide it into their own into their own cups. Indeed, though there's uncertainty about the particulars of how the Passover was eaten in Israel prior to A.D. 70, it's thought by many that this Passover liturgy, that each of the people had a separate cup. And in fact, in Luke chapter 22, verse 17, it indicates that they divided or distributed a cup of wine among themselves, suggesting that they poured its contents into separate containers. So it's not like crazy. You have many people saying at the Passover they did in fact have separate cups. You have in Luke twenty two seventeen distribute or divide this cup of wine among yourselves. So I just don't see how you can rule that out and say, no, 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 it had to be from one. And the symbolism of the oneness or the unity is not from using a single container. That's not where you get the symbolism of the oneness or unity, but it's from all sharing the same drink. You see, it's from all consuming together the fruit of the vine. I mean, dividing the communion bread into separate pieces before it's consumed, breaking the bread and passing it out. So it is consumed, having already been broken and distributed separately. That doesn't hinder the symbolism of the oneness. Why? It's because the oneness is derived from the fact that we're all eating one bread. And that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17. Although it's there oftentimes translated one loaf, which I think is a mistake. But it comes from eating the one bread, despite not all biting on a single loaf. Okay, so sometimes say, well, no, if you do that, then you destroy it. I don't think that's the case. So, so we all partake of the one drink, despite not all drinking of the one cup. Okay, as I say, that's something that's not just in churches of Christ, but there are a number of groups that think and read that. And like I say, I have respect for people who live out what they understand. I just disagree with that understanding. Now, Jesus tells them solemnly in, in verse 25 that he will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day he drinks it new in the kingdom of God. Now he's referring to the fruit of the vine of the transformed Passover. You see, the fruit of the vine of this new symbolic meal that he's creating, the one that is to be eaten in remembrance of him, as you see in Luke 22, 19, and 1 Corinthians 11, 24, and 25, It's the meal by which his death is proclaimed until he comes, 1 Corinthians 11.26. He will not again share in this symbolic meal with them, Matthew 26.29, until that day, Matthew 26.29 and Mark 14.25, when it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Luke twenty two sixteen. 16, when he drinks it new, Matthew 26, 29, and Mark 14, 24, when the kingdom of God comes, Luke twenty two eighteen. 18. So in all of these things, what I think is going on now, I'm well aware that some believe that Jesus is here teaching 
that he will again drink the wine with his disciples in some spiritual sense. He will again drink the wine with his disciples in some spiritual sense. He will share in that when he, in some spiritual sense, shares in the church's observance of the Lord's Supper after Pentecost. Okay, I I understand that there are people who think that. That's what Jesus is talking about. That he will again share in it when the church takes the Lord's Supper after Pentecost. And without wanting to diminish the Lord's presence in the assembly through the Spirit, I don't think that's a correct understanding of what Jesus is talking about. I don't think that's a correct understanding of his words. The fact the Lord's Supper is to be eaten in remembrance of Jesus and is to be eaten until he comes, that suggests that the perspective of this iteration or this mutation of the Passover meal is the Lord's current absence, not his presence. The time when he's away, awaiting his return. It's at his second coming. It's at the consummation of the kingdom when the deliverance through Christ from sin and all of its consequences that is symbolized by the supper is fulfilled. When all of that comes to completion. And it's at that time that he will again share in the meal with them in their physical presence and drink the wine. He will drink it new with them. In that the meal He'll drink it new and that the the meal is again going to be transformed. The meal is again going to have a new connotation. It will be transformed at that time into an expression of the eschaton. Into an expression of the end state. It will at that time be transformed into the messianic banquet. You see, so we have here what you have, the Passover meal... It symbolized God's deliverance from Egyptian bondage. At the Last Supper, Jesus transformed that meal into the Lord's Supper, which symbolizes God's deliverance from sin and all of its consequences through Christ's sacrifice. And at Christ's return, the symbolism of the Lord's Supper is fulfilled in that the the deliverance is consummated. Or finalized. So the meal is transformed then into the eschatological feast. The full realization of everything that's been promised. So each stage transcends the significance of the former. You have the the Passover, the Lord's Supper, the Messianic Banquet. And it's all the same meal that has been transformed through time. Now, if you think I'm odd in that, I'm not. This is how most scholars understand the reference. They understand Jesus is here referring to the eschaton, to the end time. Let me give you just three of them. Very well-known commentators on the Gospel of Mark. Daryl Bach, he says, This drinking to come is not an allusion to anything in the era of the church. But at the return and consummation of the kingdom, Jesus foresees a full vindication. This may allude to the messianic banquet. And he gives you a number of texts referring to the messianic banquet. Mark Strauss says, when I drink it new in the kingdom of God, recalls Old Testament imagery related to the messianic banquet, God's eschatological salvation portrayed as a great end time feast with the best of meats and the finest of wines and you see all the texts he cites there Jesus does not mean that he will not eat or drink at all before the consummation of the kingdom he's seen eating and presumably drinking after the resurrection Uh, rather Jesus means what he says explicitly in Luke that he will not celebrate the Passover again Luke twenty two sixteen 16, until it is fulfilled at the consummation of the kingdom. So Passover, as I see, transformed these iterations, Lord's Supper, Messianic banquet. Let me give you one more. 
<clears throat> Robert Stein says in Mark 14, 25 and Luke 22, 16, Jesus refers to a future eating of the Passover at the Messianic banquet in the kingdom of God. Each New Testament account of the Last Supper involves a positive statement concerning the future. Thus, the celebration of the Lord's Supper should not be simply a sorrowful, backward recollection of Jesus' suffering and death, but should also conclude with a hopeful looking forward to and joyous anticipation of that glorious day when believers will share with Jesus the new wine slash food of the Messianic banquet. You see, and that's what I think, that's what I think he's talking about when he says this. I won't eat it again, but the day is coming. You see, a day is coming when this place is getting the ultimate makeover. New heavens, new earth, and it's going to be unbelievably good. Amen. All right, now the last, the last Supper narrative, it ends in 1426 with Jesus and the disciples singing a hymn. And then heading out to the Mount of Olives. And this is the location of the Garden of Gethsemane. It's on the Mount of Olives. All right, 17, 14, 27 to 31. Here's where Jesus predicts uh, Peter's denial. Now, he early had, had predicted that one of the apostles would betray him. He earlier had done that. Well, he now warns that all of them will abandon him. And you got, you got to think about that. I mean, that, that would be something, you know. You think it, I know myself, you know, I know. To have the master say, all of you will abandon me. And that's, like, that, that's powerful. And, and he refers to Zechariah 13.7 as establishing the prophesied consequence of God striking the shepherd. You see that? He says you're all going to flee in consequence of God striking the shepherd. Now, Mark paraphrases Zechariah 13, 7. He says, I will strike the shepherd, speaking as God and from the text. I will strike the shepherd. Whereas the text, the text, it says that God commands his sword to strike the shepherd. Right, but you see that's God doing it, right? If he commands the sword to do it, so Mark simply paraphrases and says, I will strike the shepherd. But the point is, is that he appeals to this text where God is striking the shepherd. So what's interesting is, though it's born of human rebellion, this culpable striking of Christ has been incorporated by God into his plan of redemption. This is this foresight that I've talked about. This is his playing multi-dimensional chess. He's made this intent to thwart his plan the means of its achievement. Now, who does that? You know, you're in here and you've got this enemy and this enemy thinks he's on top of you and he's got you. He brings people in. Yes! Oh, I'm sorry. That's the means of all redemption. I mean, who does that? But it's typical of God, you see, that he takes things that just upside down and turns things around. Our David Garland says this striking of the shepherd lays on him the iniquity of us all. You see, this is God achieving his purpose through this culpable striking of the shepherd. He says that initially has a devastating effect on the flock. Jesus will reverse the breakup and regather them. All right, verse 28, Jesus for the fifth time in the gospel predicts his resurrection. He has predicted it in 831, 99, 931, 1034, and he does again here. And he tells them that he will precede them into Galilee, indicating reunion and restoration. And Peter insists that, look, if, if everybody else abandons you, he insists that he will not. But the Lord tells him solemnly that before the rooster crows twice, he will deny him three times. And Peter doubles down. He doubles down and he declares emphatically that he will not deny him, even if it means his life. And the others say the same. Now, who's right? Jesus or Peter? 
Well, Jesus. I have no doubt that Peter, Peter felt that's crazy talk. Crazy talk. You see, and that's one of the things about ourselves is we often don't understand, you know. Uh, and this comes out sometimes when you see, sometimes you'll see people who are brought into circumstances and they act in a way that you would have never thought. They wouldn't have thought, you see. But Jesus knows what's coming. And so, as I say, and all the others say the same thing. Then in third, I know this is something of an eye test, but that's good for you in the back. Cover your right eye and see if you can read the third line. All right. But I just didn't want to bust this up. So, all right. Jesus and the 11, Judas is already left to betray him, you see, in John 13, 30. But they go to Gethsemane. Now, Gethsemane, it means oil press, which suggests that the garden was actually, it was a profit-making olive grove. And such property would include an oil press. There'd be some farm buildings there. And it may also have been surrounded by a high wall to protect it from Jerusalem's hungry populace. So this is, I mean, this is an ongoing business type thing. So it may have been surrounded that way. Uh, by a populace. Now that supposition that it would have been walled off from the populace is supported by the fact that Jesus and his disciples, they could find privacy there even during the great festivals where the place is packed. You see, it's packed, but they could still go there to find privacy. So it may have been something like that. Now since Jesus had often met with his disciples, often met there with his disciples, you see in Luke twenty two thirteen. John 18, 2. This is something that he had often done. The owner had apparently placed this garden at his disposal for some time. So who the owner is? There's some speculation about that. But who the owner is, he just lets Jesus use it and has for quite a while. And Jesus tells the disciples to sit at a certain location while he prays. So he tells them to do that. And then he moves to a place some distance from the disciples, and he takes three disciples with him, Peter, James, and John. And he begins, Jesus begins to be deeply distressed, deeply troubled. And he says to the three, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. And he says, remain here and watch. He describes his sorrow as being so deep that it feels like he's dying. And the point is that his sorrow is a 10 on the sorrow scale. You do not get more sorrowful than this. Okay, it's a 10 on the sorrow scale. Yes, he knows. As the Hebrew writer says in 12.2 that there's joy on the other side. But he still has to walk the path of the cross. And he has to bear in himself the wrath of God against mankind's sins. Now we have no idea. Stan's been talking about this in his class. We have no idea how, what that entails. To take on himself, to be the sin bearer. There, Robert Stein, in his book, Jesus the Messiah, he says, Jesus feared the agony of experiencing the wrath of a righteous God against sin. You know, there are many people who have been crucified. There were many people, the Romans crucified thousands during the tax revolt in the early part of the first century. And see, but nobody was crucified as the sin bearer. This distinguishes Christ's crucifixion from everybody's. So, oh, Jesus, a lot of people sucked it up and were crucified, you know, with more dignity. Nobody is bearing the sin of the world. Okay? So he says here, Jesus feared the agony of experiencing the wrath of a righteous God against sin, whereas believers go through the experience of death with a real sense of God's presence. Jesus was about to experience abandonment by God. Believers who walk through the valley of the shadow of death have God's assurance and promise. I will never leave you or forsake you. 
Jesus knew, however, that he would become accursed during the very hour he needed God most. Nowhere do the horror and tragedy of sin become more evident than in Jesus' anguish, anguished cry from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now you tell me, you know, you and I aren't divine. We are not God the Son. We are not Jesus, God incarnate. What that means. And so you see Jesus in the garden. He is distressed. He is distressed. And he tells the three to remain here as he intends to move some distance away from them. And he also tells them to keep watch. He tells them to keep watch, meaning to stay alert to his situation and his struggle, to remain tuned in to his experience, to share in that experience with him emotionally and spiritually. Let me know you're with me. You see, watch. Be plugged in to my suffering. I want that connection with you. And Jesus goes a bit deeper into the garden, seeking solitude with the Father, and he falls down. And whether that's just in reverence, or it's because of his overwhelming sorrow, what we know is that he falls down and he prays that if it's possible, he be allowed to escape his impending ordeal, that if it's possible, that the hour might pass from him. Possible that the cup of God's wrath against sin may somehow be removed from him. He's praying. If there is any way this can be, that's what I want. If there's any way it can be. But he immediately asserts his unswerving commitment to obeying the Father's will, declaring, not, yet not what I will, but what you will. D.A. Carson, he comments, citing Bengal, he says, this is why Jesus is so troubled. The horror of death as the sin bearer. The horror of death and the ardor of his obedience were meeting. That's, that, that's the thing. I have no option of ducking out. You see, I, I don't have, that's not going to happen. It's God's will. If it's God's will, I'm doing it. I'm down completely. And so this is, he, he's facing this, and yet he's totally committed. So he goes and he lays this agony before God. He lays this agony before him in this commitment that he has. And his prayer, it raises a number of questions. And this prayer raises a number of questions. Does Jesus indicate in John chapter 12, verse 27, that he will not ask to be saved from his ordeal? Does he say there that he will not ask to be saved from his ordeal? I don't think so. Now, there are a number of Johannine scholars, scholars who spent a fair amount of their academic life focusing on John's writings, like Bernard Hendrickson, Barclay, Bruce, Beasley, Murray, Carson, Borchardt, uh, Mounts. There's a good number of them that have criticized the translations of John 12:27 that turn 12:27 into a question. I obviously botched the execution there, but... Just look at the top part. That's like the NIV. And you see how the NIV and many other translations render this. They say, my soul is troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. No, I'm not going to say that. For this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Oh, well, there are a number that translate that, but I'm telling you that that's not clear. Greek in the original doesn't have punctuation. There aren't question marks. So you have to decide from context, how do you read things? The bottom translation is certainly possible. And it makes more sense. And it's the one that would be argued for by these people I just named. It says, now my soul is troubled and what shall I say? 
Father, save me from this hour. You see, it reflects the same two things that he's talking about there. But for this, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. You see, so you can understand that perfectly consistently with what you see in the synoptics. You see the pressure, the plea, that if it's at all possible to be saved, but your will be done, not mine. Okay, so the first question that comes up when you, when you look at this, you say, well, is it contrary to what you see in John 12, 27? I'm suggesting to you that it's not. You see, it's not. That, that uh, his personal desire to avoid the horror he's facing and his overriding commitment to the will of the Father are both present. But you lose that if you do this question mark rendering. Okay, so I think, uh, I think the second one is probably correct. Now, you have another thing about does the fact Jesus is accepting, does his accepting of the cross that you see in Matthew 26, 54 and John 18, 11, does that conflict with his earlier desire that the cup, if possible, that the cup pass from him? Well, there we see he's perfectly accepting of it. Well, does that conflict with what we're looking at here? His desire that it pass from him? It doesn't. You see, those things are after the Lord's agony in the garden. See, Jesus, in reverent submission, has laid his anguish before his Father, for whom all things are possible. Right? Don't we believe that about God? You know, in other words, there are things that God does. If you are in a situation like Jesus where your heart and everything is in such turmoil and anguish, it is faithless not to bring that concern before the Father who is the God who is able to do the impossible. If Jesus had said, no, 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 I know how this is playing out. I will not bring this to you because I already know how it's playing out. Well, that would have been faithless. Because God, can you always come to God? And say, if it's possible, if it fits your will, if there is any way in what you are doing that I can be spared or I can have or I can do, then I want that. But not my will, but yours be done. See, done in a submission. So what is going on here? See, Jesus, these things, they occur after that, after that reverent submission, when it would have, he, he does that in faith, and the key is that Jesus, he was committed fully to the Father's will. I mean, that's how Jesus, he's committed to that, regardless of whether it was within his will to do the impossible in this instance. And the arrest provides the answer. You see, that's how Jesus is sitting here saying, if there's any way in your power, in your tremendous, if there's any way this can be avoided, I want that, but I'm totally down with your will. Here comes the arrest right then. Okay, the answer is no. The answer, so the fact he then accepts it after that doesn't conflict with the fact he wanted, he put that before the Father. So that's one of the things that come up. How could Jesus being divine, how could he have desired to avoid sin-bearing suffering of the cross when it was the will of the Father that he endure that suffering? He's God, isn't he? Well, how could he have, how could he have desired that when the Father's will was that he endure that? Well, Jesus is indeed God, but he's also man, right? This is the mystery of the incarnation. He is God and he is man, fully divine, fully human, two natures, not mixed, one person. And you can see why it took generations and centuries to work on these connections, to try to think through them and say, how could this be? What is God revealing to us here? You see, but he's fully God and he's fully man. In Matthew 4, 2, for example, Jesus was hungry. Meaning he desired food as does anyone during a fast. 
But at that time, it wasn't God's will for him to have food. So Jesus subjected his desire for food to the will of God. And nobody asked in that instance, how could Jesus desire food when God didn't want him to have it? Well, he desired food because hunger is part of the human experience. It's part of the human experience. He's not a pretend man. He's a real man. The incarnation is real. And so he's a real man. Though he's also God. You know, why not ask how Jesus could be tempted in every way? As we read in Hebrews, when God can't be tempted. As it says in James 1.13. You see, just as the God-man could desire food when it was the Father's will that he not have any, so he could desire to avoid the sin-bearing suffering of the cross when it was his Father's will that he endure it. And the key, again, is that he never asserted any of his desires against the will of the Father. He never did that. Rather, he subjected his desires to the will of God. And in doing that, he models that for mankind. That is how we are to be. I understand you have impulses and desires and things. You might want to smack somebody. You might want to do this. You might want to engage in that. You might want to... But what do you do? Well, in your best moments... You take that and you crucify it and you submit it to Jesus. Right? Okay, that's the model. That's what Jesus is doing. Based on Mark 8.33, when Jesus rebuked Peter as satanic for trying to dissuade him from the cross. Well, would Jesus desire to avoid the cross be satanic? Would that be satanic? Well, no, not at all. You see, Peter, in his ignorance, was trying to talk Jesus out of accepting God's will. Jesus, on the other hand, he expressed in the garden the agony brought on by his uncompromising commitment to that will. He wasn't saying in the least, wasn't trying in the least. To reject God's will, he simply was laying his sorrow his anguish, his torment before the Father. He had to do that. He was laying it before the Father, saying that if another way were within the Father's will, if there's something else that you and your great power can do, that's what I want. But what you want, I'm doing. Your will be done. I did hear that bell, Lord willing, next week. Thank you.